So um, hello to everybody and welcome or welcome back to our one and a half day webinar, Looking Back, Moving Forward, Law, Policy and Environmental Justice. I hope that everybody has eaten their Wheaties and you've got lots of energy uh, and ready for another exciting panel this afternoon. My name is Giovanna DiCiro. I'm Professor of Environmental Studies and Coordinator of the Program on Environmental Justice and Climate Resilience here at Swarthmore College. And along with my two wonderful co-organizers of this webinar, Ms. Zuline Mayfield and Dr. Chris Mele, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second panel of our webinar titled Reshaping Environmental Justice Law and Social Policy. For those of you who uh, were unable to make it uh, to the panel this morning, the recording will be available soon um, on the conference website, um, which I uh, will ask uh, uh, Nuseba to please um, drop that in the chat. Um, and that this morning, our panelists, uh, in addition to uh, sharing with us uh, some of their ideas about the strengths and the limitations of environmental law, I think that they also very tangibly and very concretely um, demonstrated the the emotional and the and the and the moral connections and stakes that are involved in communities like Chester uh, demanding their rights to equal justice under the law. And in this afternoon's panel, we're we're going to be hearing about what's happening now today in Chester and in other uh, uh, similar environmental justice communities as they continue uh, and expand their fight for environmental justice and, and the right to breathe. So um, to start out, I, I want to uh, extend our gratitude to our co-sponsors who have generously supported this webinar, um, the Lang Center for Civic and Social Responsibility, the Environmental Studies Program, and the Office of Sustainability at Swarthmore College and the Baldy Center for Law and Social Policy and the Digital Scholarship Studio and Network at University at Buffalo. We're also um, deeply grateful to the college staff and students who've helped to design and construct uh, our website and who have also helped to make this webinar run smoothly. So I want to um, uh, turn this over for a moment to Nuseba Estes, who is the Civic and Environmental Engagement Fellow at the Lang Center to give us some important information about uh, the logistics and how to participate um, in, the, in the panel today. Great, thank you, Giovanna. And to reiterate, it was really nice to hear from everyone in the first part of the panel and definitely very excited to hear how this second session goes. So as far as logistics go, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask the panelists, feel free to drop it into the Q&A box. I'm um, really excited to be able to answer those questions either asynchronously directly onto the Q&A or if we have time at the end of the session to answer it uh, in live time. If some of the questions don't get answered, we'll be populating them onto the forum which is on part of the conference's website, which I'll pop into the chat later today. I'll pass it back to you. Okay, thank you, Nuseba. So I'm going to um, introduce uh, our panelists, and, and then Chris will lay out some of the overarching questions that, that we've asked you to sort of uh, share with us today. Uh, so our panelists are Ms. Zuline Mayfield, the chairperson of Chester Residents Concerned for Quality Living, Mr. Will Jones, a Chester resident and activist and a board member of the Delaware County Solid Waste Authority, Mr. Tyler White, a Swarthmore College student, and organizer and a member of the student group Campus Coalition Concerning Chester or C4. Ms. Chantal Reyes, also a Swarthmore College student organizer and member of C4, as you can see from their, their uh, t-shirts. Ms. Maria Lopez Nunez, who's the deputy director of the Ironbound Community Corporation in Newark, New Jersey. And Dr. Steph Tai, who's professor of law at the University of Wisconsin Law School in Madison, uh, Wisconsin. So Chris, uh, over to you. 
Great, thanks, Giovanna. Uh, first, I introduce myself. My name is Chris Mele. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Buffalo um, on leave uh, this year and working with a number of initiatives in Chester. Um, and I'm uh, charged with uh, kind of introducing the set of questions that we're asking panelists to address in the next uh, hour and a half. So this morning we had a session that looked back uh, on uh, really organized around uh, the case circle uh, versus site, but really got into the discussion of uh, the situation and, uh, sur and circumstances surrounding the case. We also heard from some of the attorneys who worked on the case. And then we uh, wrapped it up with um, folks talking about uh, the present situation of Title VI um, in, uh, at least in, within the legal realm. Uh, now, uh, what we're doing is uh, we're going to be addressing initiatives that are happening at present. So I'm, I had uh, sent some prompts, uh, Giovanna and I had sent some prompts, Enzulin and I had sent some prompts to folks ahead of time. I just wanna review them for the purpose of the attendees as well. So in this session, what we're going to ask um, each of the activist folks is to just briefly describe the mission and the objectives of your organization. Uh, just tell us, describe what your organization is, is doing at this current time. Uh, the second part is the current initiatives that have gained some traction, some ideas that are either fully in place within uh, the past few years or right now or on uh, the brink of moving into a new phase that, are, that have great promise and uh, are working and you see them as gaining, again, gaining traction. Uh, some of the examples for example, uh, changes in waste management policy, some of the zero waste ordinances that we've been seeing, policy and legislation at the local, state, or federal levels that have an impact on what your group is working on, your organization, in your community. We'll then um, open up a discussion amongst ourselves about how these initiatives also have the added benefit of not only moving the agenda forward, but enhancing networking uh, within the community and uh, beyond and building solidarity and the importance of grassroots movement building in general. Lastly, we'll ask um, Professor Steph Tai uh, to address how these combination of these initiatives and the more uh, secondary aspects of movement building, et cetera, can be, are actually as significant that amplify the uh, momentum building that is necessary uh, to keep these objectives moving forward. So we're gonna start with um, uh, locally, so to speak, with uh, Circle. And we're asking uh, first Will and Celine to talk a bit about the current situation and strategies at play. So I'll turn it over to, uh, to Will first, uh, given time constraints, so thank you. Yes, uh, and Will, Will uh, is, uh, is um, is, has generously uh, come come on the panel, uh, uh, even though he's uh, in the middle of work. So, and and Will, uh, as we discussed, you know, as a lifelong Chester Chester resident um, and activist, you know, what what is what are the what's uh, what, what are you passionate about? What's important to you uh, that has made you stand up to fight for environmental justice in Chester? Well, first of all, thank you, Professor Giovanna and Professor Mele, for um for having me and giving me the um platform to to guess to um to express how I feel about what's going on currently in Chester and um, and beyond. Um, well, I've I've come to become an activist because of, quite frankly, because of Miss Zuli Mayfield. Like she's the reason why I'm here because she's the one that raised my awareness. Um, I was living my life um oblivious to what was going on in my own city, in my own hometown, the place where I was born and raised um, was completely oblivious to the plight that we were under and how really bad our circumstances really are. When you, you know, when you're from a place and you make it home, things become normalized and, you know, you become, I want to say almost nose blind to what's going on around you because it's all you know. So I was completely unaware that Chester was one of the worst cases of environmental, you know, justice, or whatever you want to call it in the country until I saw the documentary on CNN that exposed it. And, and Ms. Lee was, was on the forefront and fighting for, for so long 
And at that point, I was upset. I was infuriated. Um, and it gave me a place to use my passion. I'm a very passionate person. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm a son of a, a teacher and a, and a principal, um, and also one of the most empathetic people I believe in the world. And I'm biased, but my mother. So I was, I got a lot of, a lot of juice in me, and, um, and I was searching for a place to direct it after I came home from the military. And when I seen Miss Uline, it kind of, some kind of, you know, clicked and. I wanted to be involved. And so I reached out and, and, and got involved. And ever since then, it's been a long journey that is just taking me, you know, places I never thought I would be, um, environments and, and conversations with people I never thought I would have. And it was lucky to meet a lot of great people, a lot of passionate people about the environment. Because from being from Chester, personally, we enter sports, um, fun and, and the environment is really like we trying to figure out how to make it through like when you live in such tough conditions you got to find a way to to put blinders on and so we really oblivious to really what's going on we just focus on the, to, to the, the the qualities of life that we enjoy and that's mostly sports and entertainment so that's what i was kind of focused on and that was kind of a lot of my energy was 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 placed on but once i became aware of where it needed to be i became tunnel i got tunnel vision and i've somehow became an activist for environmental justice, which I never thought that I would ever, it, was, it, was, it wasn't on my radar. Like I said, most people from Chester, the circumstance that we live under, the environment, we don't really understand it to be a direct threat, so we don't consider it a direct threat. So that's the farthest thing from our minds. And so I would never thought I would be involved with anything environmentally, anything to do with the environment, because it was, to me, that's, that's for some other people. That saved the whales and all that stuff. That's God bless them, wish them the best, but that's, wasn't on my radar until I found out that basically myself and my family and, and everyone in Chester had been, been, been prey at the bottom of an ecosystem for a very long time. And we basically been food for a lot of people to be eating, eating off our misery and pain and, and suffering and, and just been benefiting off our plight. And, you know, that, that's not going to fly for me. That's not acceptable for me. And, and Ms. Uline is, is someone that once you get to know her, you, there's, there's no option but to fight and, and go hard. So it just helped, you know, it helped, it helped, it helped sustain the energy I had and, and push me to go further. And by the grace of God, and for some crazy reason, I was appointed to the Salawase Authority in for Delaware County, which is the first time a person of color and person from Chester been appointed to that position, which I take it very seriously. And, you know, it's, it's just a big entanglement of special interests, lobbyists, and, and corporations that made this big ball of injustice that we have to fight. And it's systemic and it's intentional. And, you know, the biggest thing I think the, the way, to, the way to, to, to defeat it is we're going to have to be grassroots and to raise awareness with the people. The same reason why I got involved is the same reason other people will get involved, but they have to understand the threat. And they don't understand it at this point. They got other stuff going on that in their mind is a bigger threat. But once the people understand about the threat, then I believe they will react to it. But we have to somehow put it in some kind of, you know, crystallize it and put it in perspective for them, for them to realize that this silent killer that you are, that has been killing you all for years, myself, my family's been decimated by cancer. Um, my mother, my aunt, my grandmother, my uncles, a lot of my family's been, 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 been killed by cancer. And I believe anyone that had anything to do with it, business, corporation, they're going to pay for it. Nobody's getting away from it. You know, nobody's getting away unscathed as far as how I feel. So I'm attacking, I'm fighting anything or anyone that had anything to do with my pain and misery, my family's death and, and, the, and the pain and death of everyone that I call neighbors and friends and family. I don't, I'm not with none of that. I went, I signed up to fight in, enemies foreign and domestic. And I believe this is a, a, a um, domestic enemy that needs to be fought with the full force of everything we got because People are literally dying. People's life is at stake. Um, people's quality of living is at stake. The mindset of our youth and the and and, and the um their their whole their whole mindset as far as what their worth and their value is is impacted by the environment and what's around them. And it's the reason why Chester is medium income is seventeen thousand and and so far below the poverty po under the poverty line and people still don't understand what's necessary to get out of it because it's been systematic and intentionally designed that way. And so we have to fight it that way. We have to raise awareness, 
to move move up the chain to make politicians understand that this is a, isn't a win. This isn't a win for you. It's it's a politically it's a politically not in their best interest to support these kind of um, endeavors and these kind of dirty businesses and business practices. And until the politicians understand and get, feel the full force of it and will discount the special interests and lobbyists is going to continue. So we have to raise awareness to the people. So they put pressure on the politicians and they, we can uh, you know, affect change and, and, and hold people accountable. But until then, it's, 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 going, it's an uphill fight that we're, we're going to have to fight because it's, it's like I said, it's a systemic situation that goes above all of us and been in place for a long time. So we're at the bottom of it. And so to get to the top, it's going to be a whole lot of layers that have to get unpeeled. And it's going to take a lot of people and a lot of, you know, a strong will and determination and, you know, endurance because it's not going to be a quick and easy fix. There's no, as Ms. Lee said, there's no magic pill, you know, to fix the situation. It's going to take determination and consistency. And the next generation with the C4 kids represent. Um, I've been spent time with these kids and worked directly with them. And I can say that they, they mean business and they're about their business. So I have confidence that the next generation is going to work with us and continue to fight that we've taken on to make sure that we get the results that, we, that we're that searching for. And these, I can't be more impressed by you. They're some of the most impressive people I've ever met in my life and I've been around the world in the military. And these kids are, and Miss Professor Giovanna, she's, she's an amazing person, an amazing leader. And I'm just so happy to be, you know, included and involved with the situation so I can, I can, you know, feel like I had some part to play in it. And I'm just honored to be here and honored. Thank you guys for giving me the platform to speak and, you know, share my story and my, you know, my perspective. And, you know, I, I, I leave the panel, you know, to, to continue on. Thank you, Will. Thank you. I, I have to correct something that uh, Will said. Um, it wasn't a uh, coincidence that he was appointed to the Delaware County Solid Waste Authority Board. There was a lot of um, a lot of work, a lot of demands, a lot of arm twisting, and a lot of I bet you better not put another white person on that board and have no representation from the city of Chester, of which you are poisoning. You will give us a seat at the table because the table belongs to us. So it was, you better not. And that's what got Will, who is a young African-American man, onto a forum that has never had a person of color, period, ever, ever, 30 something years they've been in existence, 35 years. Wasn't even considered that a Chester resident would have a, a a seat at the table. We not only got him, but we took the chairmanship. We have a circle ally who is now the chairman of the Delaware County Solid Waste Authority. Okay, so with that said, I'll move along. But Will is the next um, generation of circle, whether we're fighting an environmental front, uh, corporate, greed and uh, 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 um, politicians that don't really care about our community and are from our community. Will is the next generation of leaders and we appreciate him so much. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time, but I wanna say something that my co-chair said in the first uh, panel, that Chester is a community that has been pelted with lemons over and over and over repeatedly lemons uh, of, of pollution, of poverty, of politics, of violence. And, um, but when the pollution hit our community, um, that was the biggest lemon of all. And we've had to learn how to take that lemon and make lemonade. Now we're making sweetened variety lemonade because we are serving it up to them. They mad, they real mad because we have not gone away in 30 years. They've done everything possible and showed us every way that we can't win. But our win is what we define it to be. Yes, it's 30 years that we've been on this battlefield, 
But guess what? We've been on the battlefield for 30 years and they ain't beat us. They ain't beat us. We ain't had no money. We ain't had no slew of corporate lawyers. We don't have a PR machine. But we got determination and survivalistic instincts that are going to see us through this battle. So, Giovanna, I can come back. I want to hear from Chantel and Tyler. Uh, okay, so let, let's move on to Chantal and, and Tyler and then come back and hear about some, some of the um, coalitions that have been built, including the zero waste uh, resolutions uh, that have been successfully put in, into place. So there are some, some positive wins that are amplifying now that we'd really like to hear about. But so um, Tyler and Chantal, two, two of our amazing C4 students and graduating seniors, we're, we're gonna be sorry to see you go, but you're, you're not gonna go far. We're, we're, we're gonna keep bringing you back. Yeah. Uh, before you do that, can you all explain that, show them your shirt and explain to them who C4 is. Yes. But that little letter and it's kind of small Chantal. <laughs> Uh, do we want to do slides now or just talk about C4? Okay, so C4 stands for the Campus Coalition Concerning Chester, and it was actually started by Mike Ewell, who was on the last panel mm -hmm. earlier this morning, and when he was in college and he got a bunch of schools at the peak of C4, there were about 15 campuses in the East Coast area involved with Circle in the fight against the command incinerator and whatnot. So we're continuing that legacy um, it's been on Swarthmore's campus for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. The first ever C4 reunion actually happened on Swarthmore's campus. Mm -hmm. um, someone on the call dug up a article about a like environmental, or it was an Earth Day retreat mm -hmm. in which C4 was born out of. So luckily we had an amazing artist, Andres Perea Correa, who made our C4 logo that we can now wear on t-shirts mm -hmm. that we will be wearing to the march tomorrow. That also includes a circle logo in the back that you can't see. <laughs> So we're out here repping C4 and Circle. So um, yeah, uh, one another thing to just undermine here too, um, as graduating seniors, this is very full circle. Um, and I think that it's like quite astounding to think about where we were at like as freshmen and like having these kind of conversations, um, building relationships with Giovanna, building relationships with Zuline, um, and now building relationships with Will and Kearney and Carol and other members in Chester, but really like understanding that those relationships and that ability to have trust between people that have a shared vision and understand their roles and are being accountable and transparent towards that is really fundamental to be able to move the work forward. So just wanna say like, this has been an amazing experience, very thankful this is both like bittersweet in the sense that we're like we're excited to be graduating but also sad in the way that we've like built such relationships and, and contributed so much to this work that it now feels a part of us um, and it's something that's going to continue us as we go on into other parts of our lives um, so just a quick acknowledgement it's always like the way that we like to start out and understanding that the relationship of colonization and dispossession is a fundamental way in which communities of color and vulnerable communities have built have built in antagonistic and oppressive relationships um, to land and to being extracted and being exploited, um, and also just being understanding um, of the histories of slavery, the histories of indigenous colonization, and understanding that, um, especially in the last panel, we were talking about institutions that contribute to these processes, that contribute to perpetuating extractive relationships and understanding that our institution academia is, is one that wasn't mentioned. Um, this is obviously an example of how academia can be generative, can be productive, can be helpful, um, but that's not always the case. So we wanna make sure that we're understanding that Swarthmore currently occupies the ancestral land of the Lenny Lenape people and the Chester residents are descendants of slaves that were brought here for a very particular reason and continue those, those same relationships to slavery, to white supremacy, to extraction, just in new legitimate forms. Um, we always like to make sure that we understand our connection to space. Um, Chester is right there in the middle with the heart. Uh, our school is right here um, at the top and we have the Covanta incinerator right down the road. So total of six miles um, and yet the life expectancy is a difference of 12 years. 
And that is just something that we really wanted to understand and we wanted to take on um, to know that if we're going to be here for four years, then it's our responsibility to, to maximize um, our accountability and our relationship to the waste that we're generating, not, uh, not only through um, what's being incinerated and burned, but also through our actual like sewage waste that's also being burned in Delcora and understanding that that we are responsible for how that impacts the residents of Chester. And it's not all, it's, it's not the responsibility of Chester residents to be advocating for that, but it's our responsibility as the people that are continuing to perpetuate that and be complicit in that relationship. Um, that fundamental understanding is what's really allowed us to kind of launch forward um, into building and, and understanding that we are a student-led engagement with Chester. Um, we act as the arm of circle. We, we do the work that they tell us to do. Um, and that is a very fundamental way that we want to undo extractive relationships in academia is not coming into places and prescribing what needs to be the solution, but instead being the instruments and the tools by which that work is done. And we want to really reimagine um, waste processes. And that's what a lot of the zero waste work has been has been in advocating for that. And also is establishing a coalition um, among Chester organizations. As Will was saying, folks in Chester are inundated by a lot of issues um, and environmental justice does not, does not always come up in, in, in the common language as being that reason. So we also wanna understand the ways in which education, the economic um, situation, as well as violence are all intersecting around this, co this holistic notion of what environmental justice is, but really harping in on Chester residents' concern for quality living. Quality living is not only about what you're breathing, but it's also where you're able to work, having spaces that you feel safe in, and really kind of trying to work together to, to build the capacity to, to enact that work. Um, so we try to do that through student-led programming and partnerships um, in which we will go into a whole list of the different ways we do that. And secondly, trying to think critically about how we build those new partnerships so that, um, so that we're not also just a tool and an arm for Circle, but we're a tool and an arm for trusted residents across a multitude of different issues that they're trying to address. So our vision, number one, is um, abolition. Uh, we do want to get rid of the incinerator, and we also want to get rid of the relationships that exist between economic value, um, extractive um, practices, and the idea that it is justified to pollute people of color and low-income folks. And secondly, to, to reimagine not only like what the relationships of academia and students are to, to communities around them, but to also really begin to institutionalize that in a way that this is something that just students on campuses, not only here at Swarthmore, but some of our other um, C4, our current C4 members at UPenn, Widener, um, and Villanova, that that's a way in which all student, um, students at different campuses are really engaging with their communities is thinking like, how do we really offer up ourselves and not really come in with our own object ob objectives and to move forward with committed relationships and understanding that relationship building, showing up, being accountable, doing the work that we can do. Ms. Zuline has always told us, I don't know how much time you have, but give me however much you have and do the work. And that is what we try to do and really trying to move that as a philosophy in the way that we engage with other campuses and other college students as well. So some of the work that we have is we have three major um, um, groups within C4. Direct action, they help a lot in organizing different um, direct active um, um, projects, whether that be showing up at county council meetings, whether that be leading in, in, in organizing protests, whether that be um, engaging with, uh, with uh, different stakeholders and, and, and other folks in the community. We also have print materials, which helps to like produce the actual material either for circle events or for C4 events. We also have a partnerships plus. Those are the folks that are trying to think strategically about how we build partnerships on campus. How do we access resources? Um, college campuses have abundant resources um, and they accumulate them um, throughout years and have been accumulating them and really uh, thinking about in an abolitionist framework is how do we disseminate that and not only democratize it but really put it in the hands of community to decide how they want to use it. Uh, we're also co-leaders of a course that um, that we've been teaching this semester which is fulfilling and continue on continuing on a lot of the, that group work that um, Professor DeCuro Giovanna has 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 created a framework for us for and then the Chester Road Collaborative is a very very successful $25,000 grant that we got through the Lang Center um, in the Project Pericles in which we're trying to uh, 
um, not only use that money to access as a resource for Circle, but also to think strategically about how we begin to bring different camp, uh, different groups on campus together to really understand and actualize that holistic understanding of what environmental justice looks like in Chester, but also on other campuses. Thank you, Tyler, for that great setup. Now I'm going to get into the nitty gritty details of what C4 does. I do want to give a quick shout out to both Instagrams. The circle Instagram is at Chester underscore EJ, where you will see so much uh, stuff put on by Sandria. Mm -hmm. And our C4 dot Chester is our own C4 Instagram, where I actually stole this post from because I made it there. <laughs> so these are just some of the past events. Uh, Tyler already touched on this, but a lot of Swarthmore C4 students were able to make comment at a borough a meeting to pass the zero waste resolutions. And both of these are like symbolic uh, resolutions that show that many boroughs and municipalities within Delaware County like support this move towards zero waste. So here's just a list of other boroughs and townships that also pass zero waste resolutions. But luckily we have some Swarthmore students able to make comment at this because we are Swarthmore borough citizens. Um, there were also a time in the spring of 2021 during COVID where some C4 students came out to help the Save Chester Water Authority and where we got to sign petitions and mm -hmm. give out flyers. So that even though there were very few students on campus at that time, we still had a few come out for this event. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the first ever EJ Day March in Chester. Um, this is April of 2021, where literally breaking school rules to leave campus and go to this march and support Circle and Chester, where we marched from Chester City Hall all the way down to Covanta and had a bunch of rallies there. So this is really huge. It's momentous and was really great occasion to like see a lot of things that we had been talking about over Zoom actually come together in person on this day. And we're having another one tomorrow, which I'll get into later. C4 were partnered with University of Pennsylvania C4 students. Like Tyler said, we partnered with Widener and UPenn and in the past Villanova. This was a really, really important event for us because we were put on, on a festival with musicians and artists and also a fundraiser that was on UPenn's campus and like in the middle of downtown Philadelphia. So we got huge exposure that we got to raise money for the GoFundMe as well as like cash donations. And a lot of people learned about what was the Covant incinerator and that their trash was also being sent there. So this was a really huge successful event for us. We put on through Professor DeKiro's course last semester. Tyler mentioned that we're co-teaching a course this semester, but really that scaffolding was started last semester where Professor DeKiro gave us the opportunity to lead student groups, the students through these groups that Tyler mentioned. And one of these was actually a youth workshop that was put on last like winter mm -hmm. in which students got to learn about environmental justice, learn about the incinerator as a young children, which is really important because Zulene has emphasized that younger generations need to learn about this so that they mm -hmm. too can work against it. Mm -hmm. um, the brunt of our work has really been showing up to county council meetings. These happen bi-weekly in media. We're really fortunate in that we get to turn left and go to media and just like take a 10 minute ride, take a bunch of students and show up to this county council meeting. I think we've definitely made a major impact in terms of that the county council members now recognize us as soon as we walk into the door and they know what we're gonna say once comment arises. So this has happened actually also from last fall all the way up until this spring where we've been showing up to these meetings, talking about circles, talking about the incinerator, talking about our opposition to the contract being re-signed that actually was re-signed, but I'll get more into details about that. Um, and so that's been a lot of our work is going to these meetings, going to the Solid Waste Authority meetings and understanding our political power in these arenas. And so this is actually a video that I took at the Delaware County Solid Waste Authority meeting, which I think is super powerful. It's just a minute long. Um, so I'm gonna play it really quickly. So uh, barring that, any other comments or questions, I'll, I'll call the question all in favor uh, of supporting the motion as read. Aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. One. Any abstentions? Motion passed. Thank you all very much. We move on to the next item on the agenda. So in that you can see, well, this is the Solid Waste Authority meeting. This is who said nay was Will Jones, who you heard speak earlier. That was the only person in opposition to the Covanta contract with Delaware County. As you can see, it's a full room of white men besides Tyler, Will, Carol, and Zuline 
and some other members. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a really powerful moment because not only are they all saying, yes, I agree with this new contract and it's only Will saying no, but even uh, the chairman says, okay, now let's move on to the next agenda item. It's really just an agenda item to them. This is in media. Jess Cattere, a circle ally, spoke earlier in the meeting that you guys getting, didn't get a chance to see. And she said, why is the meet meeting being held in media? Mm -hmm. This contract is affecting people in Chester who are more than 20 minutes away. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't even make it because the meeting time was changed. So as you can see, there's already some barriers to justice in terms mm -hmm. of speaking up to these meetings, showing up to these meetings, as well as who are the people sitting at the table, who are the people in power? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to show this for everyone because it's like so stark, it's so yeah. obvious. It's almost like funny. I'm like, wow, like this is crazy. This happened a week ago. Like this is not 20 years ago. This is not 30 years ago. It's not 40 years ago. This happened eight days ago. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show that for you all. So uh, far in any other comments or questions? Okay. Another part of our C4 work has been going against the Subaru Corporation. This is a little bit more covert in that the Subaru Stadium on the waterfront that Tyler's map showed was that the Subaru Stadium takes up the last publicly accessible area for Chester residents to access the Delaware River, on top of the fact that the Subaru Stadium boasts a zero landfill status. And the only reason it's zero landfill is because they're getting their trash sent to the incinerator that they can actually see from the stadium. Mm -hmm. So we've been tax tasked with flyering at the Subaru Stadium. And these are some C4 students there passing out flyers to attendees at the stadium so that they may learn about the issue. And now I'm gonna move into our some of the things that are not pictured. So with a lot of the grants and money that we've been able to get at Swarthmore, we're paying students to do research, we're paying students for media and, and related projects, really building up this capacity of people who are super busy and who want to dedicate some time to a really important cause. And the Project Pericles funding, oh, sorry, mentioned, <laughs> as well as weekly meetings and bonding activities. And this has been really crucial to us being able to continue hanging out with each other, spending time with each other, and having fun with each other. Attending Zoom calls that are bi weekly. And like I said, our connections with UPenn and Widener. And I want to give a shout out to our very important big events coming up. Tomorrow, if you can make it in person, we're marching once again from Chester City Hall to the Covance Incinerator and to the Subaru Stadium, who coincidentally is having a game. So we're really excited to show up. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to the Camden headquarters of Subaru May 2nd, which is a Monday. Um, so we're taking some students out there. You'll see it on the website, on the Instagram, if you guys all able to join. I was also asked to share this uh, with uh, from Dre, who spoke earlier at the last meeting, who is another Chester resident, having a screening of the Laid to Waste documentary, which really shed light to this important issue. So thank you guys so much for your time. And I'm really glad I got to speak and share all these amazing things with you all. Yeah, just wanted like just harp on what Chantal was saying here. Um, kind of like our long term effect has been really trying to hold stakeholders and folks of Delaware County accountable for their contributions to environmental racism and sending not only their their, um, their trash waste, but their sewage waste to um, Chester, but also the zero waste resolutions, um, this Covanta contract that even though it's not the ideal situation that we want, it does take away this like minimum amount of trash that has to be sent there. And the language that we're hearing from Delaware County, um, so the Delaware a county solid waste authority is that it allows for them to begin the process of looking at alternatives um, and they're also the delaware county council has agreed to a zero waste strategic plan um, that really from one of our mentors from our own piece of project um, and they also have a community advisory council which chantelle is a part of and some i think so there's other residents Erica from chester and are also part of it, that, yeah. that are um, from chester that are part of it so we, we are seeing some actual effects from the work that we're doing um, and last thing that we also want to underscore is long-term goals. We, we really want to expand C4's membership. Um, we know that at one point there was 15 campuses, so we want to move our current five up to that 15 and beyond. We also want to collaborate with other student groups on campus and really maximize our Project Pericles funding to be able to engage more students on campus, to be engaged in Chester and really facilitating that process, while also like equipping students with proper training on how to be engaged with community members and really using that as an asset of understanding how to be engaged with community throughout their lives and also pursuing new avenues of sustainable funding a lot of funding that we've got that we have 
have received is like one-time funding. So we want to be able to think critically about how do we like create avenues of sustainability and create sovereignty and autonomy for Chester residents, but also for circle members. Um, and then initiate new relationships with Chester organizations. There's so much stuff that's happening right now in Chester and we really want to capitalize on that and maximize our capacity to be assets um, to Circle and to some of their allies but other folks in the community that are doing work that really it kind of expands across the board but our main goal is to really deepen our capacities and deepen our relationships so that we can really kind of like transcend this rapid turnover also transcend the normative extractiveness of academia and really construct students that are not just engaged scholars but actually like residents and like folks that have relationships and are neighbors and really understand their their role and activate their privilege to be able to 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 be a a a a, a caveat like to to create new opportunities for for new relationships so thank you all so much for listening to us and we're really glad to hear questions but thank you all again sorry sorry but thanks so much to Chantal and Tyler. Um, you, you can see why uh, Zulin and I are are so are so proud and so amazed at uh, our our young people, our students. Um, and um, I, I think what we want to do is to move on to our next speaker, um, Giovanna. Yep. Uh, we have to say this, it, it just is not possible, or it is possible, but it's also um, extremely helpful to engage students who are actually going to get some sort of credit for doing the work. So some inventive and innovative uh, professors at Swarthmore College have somehow or another made it possible that they can get course credits, which is important to groups like Circle. It is important to students, you know, when they want to volunteer and help their time. Um, and I think that it should be replicated in every community that has these um, wealth of, of, of these institutions there to tap into them. These students do research for us. <clears throat> they stand on lines for us. Um, I'm their biggest cheerleader, the biggest one. I, I got a whole slew of other children, um, but they're not children. I have to stop saying that. Um, I'm gonna cry like a baby when they graduate. Chantel, because of the work that she's done with Chester has now determined that she wants to be an environmental lawyer. Tyler, I'm not gonna cut him loose. I don't know what he's gonna do. He's going to Boston, but. <sighs> Tyler's going to graduate school also to uh, uh, become a, a, an, an environmental justice informed urban uh, planner so, and designer. So he'll, he'll be back too. You, you well, once you build these relationships, sorry, you just don't you're, you're you just don't leave. You you may be gone for a while, but you'll be back. And yeah. uh, and, and I just had some students, um, Russ Stark and Betsy. Um, they were students that were at Swarthmore College in 1995. Graduated, she became a pediatrician. Russ got into local government. They came back last year and we sat down and chatted. Um, so these are lifelong um, relationships. And um, we so appreciate C4 in the city of Chester and for Circle. Um, it was incepted just to help Chester residents concern with quality living. We don't mind them branching off and helping other people, but they belong to us. So y'all can stop that foolishness. <laughs> well, and, and Zulane, your point about universities and colleges. Um, they have to get involved. Yeah. They have to, if they really want to cultivate minds and put these, um, the next generation of folks that have to inhabit this earth, 
Mm -hmm. Put them in touch. You know, most campuses and colleges and universities and things of that nature are in sort of a bubble. They, they are in places that are unrealistic. Everything is beautiful. Everything is quiet and serene. But if you go a couple of blocks in either direction off of that campus, you hit the real world. So why not teach students in a real world setting? Why not link them up with communities like Chester? You know, why not link them and have that type of, of holistic relationships? Because we all don't live in bubbles. We leave out of our bubbles when we leave our homes and go into the world. So they have to be taught real time world things. Like I tell the students, I tell them this all the time. You will get practices and pro procedures and protocols in the classroom. But when you come to Miss Mayfield and to come in the circle, I'm going to teach you real life shit. Okay? It's going to be real life. I don't play no games. We get right to the point. If you tell me, Ms. Zuline, Ms. Zuline, I can give you an hour a month. I want my hour. And I'm going to get my hour out of you. If you commit to it, because I'm also giving you time, my time. And I don't have a lot of it to give. So if you commit, I'm gonna make that same commitment to you. Um, I don't need for you to tell me what to do because you're younger than me. Not saying you can't teach me new technology and what you are learning because it's an invaluable road. These students have access to technologies and research and and machinery and technology that a, a group like Chester residents does not have access to, or we didn't, but they teaching me that I, I still ain't got a Twitter or an Instagram account, but they're teaching me. So these type of relationships are extremely important and it also broadens your power base. I can't tell you how many times Delaware County Council has at first initially when when they came in and filled the room of council chambers it was like every council person was like oh my god oh my god who are these students who are these kids who are these young folks and repeatedly well we're glad you're here uh and and we hope that you would stay in our community when you're done school yeah you really don't know what you're asking for these are progressive people. These are change the world people. But they are always acknowledged, whether it be hostile or, you know, welcoming, you know, but these are, this is our future and, and we're so grateful for them. So grateful. We built some great relationships, great relationships, not only with the students, with, but with the professors and the academics that gear or, or stir, steer uh, 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 their students in our direction. It's extremely important, so. Yeah, thank you, Zulene, for those comments. And really the question is, what is education for? Um, and I think that our, our students are responding to that. Um, so I, I'd like to invite um, Maria Lopez Nunez. My girl. To, yeah, to- uh, hey, uh, Maria. We've never met, you know, face to face personally, but she is my kindred spirit. How are you? Okay. All right, I'm gonna be quiet. Cause you know, I, 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 sometimes I'm a little chatty. Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Maria Lopez Nunez, and I haven't had the pleasure, I will soon enough, of meeting, meeting Ms. Zuline in person. Um, but the reason we met is because we have sister communities, right? Of um, In Chester, it's just it's such an inspiration, everything that Chester has done and has been fighting. So where I work for, I work for the Ironbound Community Corporation. Don't hold that against us being a corporation. It was founded in the 60s. It was a community corporation, and we thought we were going to take that take back the power, right? So now in 2022, I find myself giving disclaimers about our name, but we were founded 53 years ago as a community um, 
child care center because a lot of the women in our neighborhood just didn't have access to child care, right? So they came together and they were taking care of each other's children. Um, fast forward to the 70s and 80s, there were explosions in our neighborhood, right? Because there were a lot of illegal dumping sites, some of them near schools that were catching on fire. Um, another thing about our neighborhood, right? We're the ironbound section of Newark, New Jersey. For those of you that don't know, Newark looks like a pork chop. You know, I really think of it as a pork chop and we're on that fatty round piece. And our neighborhood is actually surrounded by the longest Superfund site in the country. And that's the Passaic River. On the Passaic River, um, during the Vietnam War, Ironbound was actually the largest producer of Agent Orange. And a byproduct of Agent Orange, you know, which is dioxin, it's this white dust that's incredibly cancer causing. It comes out of incinerators. That was being dumped into the river and that white dust was being picked up and put all over our neighborhood. So even in ground pools, public pools, they had to be closed down because there was so much contamination that a lot of my colleagues were swimming in, right? So during that time when we were having that Agent Orange debacle, there was the proposal to put an incinerator in every county in New Jersey, you know, because our incinerator was around the same time as most incinerators. It was the wave of the future in the 80s. People thought we were just going to burn trash and we would never have to deal with trash again. And so the proposal would be that every single county would have their own incinerator. But of course, immediately upon hearing of the proposal, wealthier counties were immediately saying they would pay Newark, Essex County, to take their incinerators. So what was headed for Newark was four incinerators before the proposal was even passed. So it is our great, even though we have an incinerator, we have to remind ourselves we'll be back three because the Ironbound teamed up with many organizations across the state to beat back the proposal. Unfortunately, we ended up with an incinerator in Newark and in Camden, they ended up with an incinerator. There are two majority black cities in our state, right? And of course, we're the ones that ended up with garbage incinerators. So our garbage incinerator was never supposed to be built as big as it was, right? It was supposed to be a municipal incinerator just dealing with this local trash. But instead, right now, 50% of our trash is actually coming from New York City. It's not our trash. It's other people's trash, and I know Chester can relate. So that's where our fight started. It started, you know, um, it wasn't even EJ exactly at the time, right? We were before environmental justice got its name, but I know environmental justice has been alive and well in this country since indigenous people were forcefully removed and people were forced into the uh, forced to come to this country as slaves. So I think EJ comes back all the way back, right? Um, and we've been fighting our incinerator since the late 80s. We fought for it not to be constructed. And then we've been fighting ever since, which is our fight against Covanta. Um, in that process, it's been pretty bleak. We haven't got much traction, right? Because our incinerator just makes a ton of money for the county. There are no viable alternatives. Similarly, y'all, Red Bull says it's run on 100% renewable energy. And we could see it in the same line, we could see the incinerator. but. Of course, most people don't know incineration is not renewable and incineration does get those subsidies. So currently we are fighting and I'm so grateful for Ms. Lane's help. She even helps us design workshops in New Jersey to fight incinerators, right? She has a wide, wide reach, has cast a long net. Um, in our community, just so y'all get also a sense of other things, we're not just fighting incineration. We also currently have three power plants in our four square mile neighborhood, and we're fighting against a fourth power plant. We also have the largest um, waste sewage treatment facility for the state. And all of this that I'm mentioning is just unfortunately in that four square miles. We're also host to the Port of Newark and Elizabeth, which is the largest port on the East Coast. And it has like most of the consumer goods that go through this area that come in you know, from other countries through that port, get on trucks. And we're called iron bound because we're bound by iron, bound by iron, you know, um, tracks on one side and a bunch of highways on the other side, which makes our neighborhood, our little four square miles <laughs> that we've been defending. And so we've had many wins and we've been able to take this neighborhood level organization really to get it statewide and national um, recognition for the work we do because EJ really matters and I strongly believe that the future will be led from the ground up. There's no way around that. It has to come from the ground. Think tanks, universities, there's a place for that but really it's the people that live in the communities that drive the solutions that fight back because the stakes are higher, the stakes are different. You know our folks we're fighting for our lives. We're not fighting to make breakthroughs or for <laughs> academic credit. You know like 
um, I, you know, uh, writing, publishing, it's none of that. It's actually just to have healthy lungs. We, you know, we all have people with asthma, with cancer in our lives. My mom got COVID last year and she still hasn't recovered. You know, she's still on oxygen a year later with poly permanent lung damage. And it all comes from where we live and how we grow up, right? I myself have a constant battle with my asthma. And so I think this work is just like deeply emotional and spiritual for our communities. And that's where the real solutions are gonna come from. And it'll be to this country's, you know, <laughs> demise or glory if it actually listens to the communities, especially the communities that it's hurt and marginalized. Um, and so in that sense, in the spirit of environmental justice, we're just all connected. You know, there are communities like ours, like Chester, like Ironbound throughout this country. And unfortunately, we've turned the global south into that as well. And so I, I went by just saying we can win, right? Like with Ironbound um, Community Corporation, New Jersey Environmental Justice Line and Clean Water Action, we actually um, a year and a half ago passed the strongest environmental justice law in the country. You know, we're not national organizations, we're not think tanks, we're just neighborhood people who've been fighting for our lives. And we got a law that says that in environmental justice communities, you can no longer build new facilities that contribute to the burden of pollution on that community. So if, and we didn't say disproportionate or no fancy words, it's just if you increase pollution in our neighborhood, it's a shall deny, you know, those shall deny are like words, <laughs> they're my favorite words. It's not a may deny, it's not the discretion of other people for our lives. It's a mandate. It's a mandate to protect our communities, to stop digging the hole that got us here in the first place. You know, so I, I hope I've shared about my community and there are many examples, you know, throughout the country of how communities win. And when communities win, we win big. <laughs> and so I really hope um, that folks keep listening to the front lines and thank you so much. And Ms. Elaine, anything you need. I right? love um, you. Yeah, thank you for I inviting me you. here. And of course, I'll, I'll do anything for this lady right here. So thank you all. Hey, listen, I'm on my way if you need me. And I know you need me, but more importantly, we as leaders have to uplift and support each other. This shit is not easy. It really is not. And it, I think it's harder for, in this world, and it's still sexist, it's still racist. We're still looked at as women leaders, less than, <laughs> I don't know how, but they try to qualify it as less than. Okay, no, we don't even play that shit. But anywho, we have got to, like I have expressed to Maria and, and others that we've been on some calls with, the corporate polluters meet constantly. They have symposium conferences and they learn what to do in order to get over on us and the regula regulators and everybody else. And they form a sort of a business alliance. Marie and I have been talking about forming an alliance. So far, right up in the, in the tri-state area, we're all, we all have communities that are impacted severely by Covanta. And we are going to get together an alliance, uh, uh, you know, even though we all have our own little issues, we can support each other. However, we can send a bigger message. No, you're just not dealing with Newark. You're dealing with Camden, you're dealing with Chester, you're dealing with Harrisburg. And we're gonna get that, we're gonna get this done. We're all, she's extremely busy. I'm, I ain't got no sense though, you know? In between this conference, I did a, a radio interview. I got one at 5.30. I, I have no sense. I really don't. That's why I'm homesick now. But um, we talk about self-care for each other and about us supporting each other, venting to each other. And we need to have that available for us so we can continue this work. Um, but they getting it done. We getting it done. And whatever they can do, we can replicate it and vice versa. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. But this is all about broadening your power base. People in New York better know when they screw with Ironbound, they're going to get emails and phone calls from people from Utah. When you screw with somebody in Chester, yeah, you're going to get a call from Canada. And that's what's going to stop this crap. That's what's going to stop it. 
Oh, we just viewing with we we just dealing with the power powerless people. They financially powerless. They're politically powerless. But now you got to deal with somebody who know your wife, and she getting a phone call, and your children are bringing it home because they've learned about it at Swarthmore College campus. That is what's going to bring some remedy to the situation. But I love you, girl. I'm so glad you came. See, I got friends everywhere, Tyler. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I'll Zulu. share them with you, Marie. He badass now. He a bad boy, both of them. Well, he's gonna be in between. He's gonna be in Boston, so I'll I'll let you have a part of him. But he ain't going nowhere. <laughs> I'm gonna be Tyler Stalker. So, so one, one, one question, um, Maria, if, um, so you, you talked about, uh, your, your, your organization and, and allies and coalitions successfully getting the strongest environmental justice law in the country passed. Um, so just, if you could say maybe just a few sentences about how that, that happened. And then secondly, I know that you are also on the White House Environmental Justice Adv Advisory Council, um, which, of course, is uh, I'd be I'd be interested to to know if you have a couple of sentences of the extent to which you think being part of that you know federal space um, uh, is going to move forward. And, and one of your colleagues. Kyle Powis White is going to be speaking tomorrow, and I know that he's also on the, the council. Giovanna, I'm the only one allowed to cuss. Did, did I cuss? <laughs> no, you asked her to talk about the White House panel. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so about how we got it passed. Well, first off, like, it took 12 years, right? So I don't want to pretend it was easy. Um, but I think I, I just highlight the 12 years to talk about, we have to have our work ready when the political windows open. Political windows just open. We can't always force them open. Sometimes we can, but not always. Um, and so the, there was a political moment we know during COVID where everybody was trying to say Black Lives Matter and trying to figure out what to do. In those moments, you got to be ready because I, I call it the racial merry-go-round, like folks care about race for, and then they start forgetting about race again. <laughs> Something happens, they care again, you know, so when the miracle go comes your way, you got to be ready to try to pass progressive legislation. I think our movement, sometimes we, we want everything perfect and we wait too long, you know. We keep crafting and crafting. Sometimes we need uh, to act, right, um, especially when it comes to policy change. We need that. We need to change the rules because um, short of a revolution, that's that's what we got, changing the rules through policy. Um, and so one thing we did that I thought was very important is we didn't let anybody speak for us, you know, as a, a community. Sometimes it's really tempting to team up with other people because you think they're smarter than you and you know something is up. But one thing I've learned in this work is everyone's kind of bluffing it. You know, everyone's faking until they make it. They just create whole new vocabularies in academia sometimes that make them feel real self-assured, but it don't mean much in the community and their application of their policies really don't make a difference for us, you know? And so that's why when we were negotiating that those policies, we didn't let other people negotiate for us because they might know better. We actually read the policy ourselves and we're like, this probably won't work. We've seen this loophole used before, you know, like, and so I think that that helped make it what it is, the strongest policy, right? Because um, we were closing loopholes that have strangled out communities in the past. Um, and like I said, we didn't let anybody speak for us. We, we demanded from our green partners and from our allies that they stand with us behind us, right? Because oftentimes they want to bring you up as a token, um, just tokenize you and say, look, we're helping them or have the savior complex. We wanted to make sure that we were showing communities across the country, we can win and you can win by yourself. You know, like you lead and you can lead other forces and big resources to come behind you. And tomorrow, you not just with Kyle, but actually I'm really close to most of the folks on your panel tomorrow, right? Jackie Patterson, Ana Bautista. That's the thing about having a community and being accountable to a movement is that we all know each other and we have to well, work well with integrity with each other, right? To make sure we're always uplifting and pushing environmental justice. And then when it comes to the WeJack, if I could real quick, 
I'm not saying it's the end all be all, right? Like, I hope no one thinks we made it just because now there's a White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. I'll be honest, and I'm nervous because it's being recorded, but I feel like a glorified intern, right? <laughs> Having to come back <laughs> into a circle. We're doing a lot of work um, to try to just put some flags in the sand that then the movement can uplift. At the end of the day, everything is still a struggle and our communities need to continue fighting with different agencies for the, the equitable, the true application of Justice 40. Otherwise, these policies will end up being used against us. And 10 years from now, we'll do financial autopsies and realize it was just a PR moment, you know, but things won't make it. Justice 40, just because it's written, is not a promise or the panacea. We need to make it what we want it to be. And that's always been the case in this country. You know, that's what democracy really is, is the people getting involved and participating in their governance. So again, thank you all for the opportunity and I'll pass it back. Thank you, Maria. Does that doesn't that sound familiar? It doesn't that sound familiar if you're pelted with lemons to make lemonade? Yep. That's basically what Maria just said. So that is the overalling um consensus among community folks. We're gonna use what we got. Absolutely. And and don't be somebody else's uh PR strategy. Like well, like the, I said, there is no cavalry but us. Yeah. You wait for the cavalry if you want to, you'll be a bunch of skeletal bones. We are the cavalry. So thank you. Thank you again, Maria. Uh, the, this is fabulous. Um, so our, our final panelist for today, uh, Dr. Steph Tai, um, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I am humbled to come after all of you, um, especially as an outsider in the Midwest. Um, I'm zooming here in from Mad Madison area um, where the original inhabitants were the Ho-Chunk people and Dejok was a name given to this area, meaning many lakes. Um, it's especially humbling to speak after you because you're doing so much amazing work on the ground. It's really thrilling to hear about all these projects and to hear about everyone's passion they bring to their activism. Um, you know, there's amazing work, it sounds like, that's being done by Circle, uh, moving towards zero waste, abolishing incineration. Just this fact that some of these votes have changed over time, that's that's at least somewhat of a positive thing. Um, the fact that you've gotten on the board is an, a positive thing, and it's going to be a fight forever. As you've heard, I think, already, and you'll hear again, some of the legal tools are extremely lacking. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about a bit um, here today is, you know, what do we do given the sort of lacking strength of a lot of um, legal tools? Well, part of it is that too often lawyers think of it as they're just, you know, they have a patriarchal kind of hierarchical nature of lawyering, coming in to be like the sort of white knight, and I don't mean that, I do mean the white part of it, the white knight trying to save a community, and that's not particularly effective, as you guys are talking about, especially, you know? So, um, so my work highlights some of the work of activists in Detroit, again, because I'm in the Midwest, but how lawyers can sort of be more humble, step back from trying to take the lead and instead tailor their work to amplify the voices of community members rather than sort of trying to lead community members. Um, and so I worked with um, a friend of mine to write this paper, um, J.S. Patel of Street Democracy Detroit, which is a community justice nonprofit in Detroit. Um, and what we looked at was some of the stuff in the Detroit water crisis, which he worked with. And the water crisis, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, was basically Detroit shutting off um, all of these housings, um, housing um, projects water. Um, so people didn't have access to clean water, which is essential, right, for both um, our lives and also essential for the environment. Um, and so what we applied was this scaffolding approach, analyzing what succeeded in Detroit, what didn't. And we saw that this really follows an approach that you guys are all already talking about, an approach that helps amplify voices rather than um, sort of um, try to take the voices. Um, so the, this is an approach that's drawn from educational theory and is designed to move students progressively toward stronger understanding um, and greater independence in the learning project. Uh, process. And so um, Will talked about that in terms of getting activated was part of the learning, um, the learning process was important. Um, this awareness building process was important. And so um, the approach in community justice lawyering using scaffolding is using lit litigation as this scaffold um, for local mobilization and empowerment rather than as a direct method to achieve change. 
this requires a totally different look at quote unquote lawyering skills. A lot of times, you know, if you think of the sort of 60s kind of lawyering, it was known as impact lawyering. That is finding some key case to make changes to the law. Um, it's turned out to be very difficult in the EJ space. And so what's been more effective that we've seen and uh, we've experienced is the idea that these types of legal tools can be reversed to empower communities and community members towards independence in their activism rather than reliance upon lawyers. And so the three prongs involve creating opportunities for storytelling and engagement in the political process. And that can be with the filing of lawsuits, but the lawsuit, the ultimate outcome isn't the point of it. It's to use that to bring things to the news, to bring things to the community, to allow community members to tell their stories about why say a lawsuit was raised or public comments were submitted, et cetera. Um, and sort of engage them to further build up um, their own sort of empowerment and skills. Um, another focus is a focus on visible rallying and polarizing points for movements. Again, this can be in the form in, for example, in the Detroit um, um, case study that we talked about that my friend was involved in. Um, we focused on how there were letters submitted to the UN about sort of right to water and the UN commissioners even came in to visit. And this provided a space um, for very visible rally. People had something to march for um, this right to water. Um, and then the use of structures and deadlines for galvanizing nascent campaigns post litigation. Um, what does that mean? It means that laws, um, even if something is not necessarily um, a legal tool that can be used successfully, it can be used to start the clockwork, right? Um, if you have a petition in many types of administrative areas, um, there has to be a response from an agency or from a committee within a certain number of days. That starts a clock where you can start to sort of rally community members to sort of pound on their um, doors and sort of respond to that clock ticking process. And so the idea is to use that um, to motivate community members um, and to sort of further empower community members because they know there's a sort of timeline um, that governments, um, politicians, et cetera, have to respond to. And so, you know, in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep this short, but the idea of this is that in, in sort of what's reflected in what I've heard in all of your talks is the idea is that the lawyer is not supposed to lead. The lawyer is rather supposed to help give additional tools, the kind of tools that community members need to do their work. So that's where I'll stop. Thank you, thank you. We we um the, this morning in this morning's panel we we heard from several lawyers and scholars who who said a similar thing that that the um, legal tools, including lawsuits, should be seen as organizing tools, as organizing strategies, um, and uh, to sort of build a sense of of community and a sense of, of um, a sense of empowerment, really. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if any of the panelists uh, would like to ask questions of each other or share thoughts from what they've heard from, from um, what people have, have spoken about today. Chantal, as a future uh, environmental justice lawyer, do, do you have any thoughts about, about uh, your hopes for, for um, engaging the law? I don't I mean to put you on the spot. Uh, um, Professor uh, Steph like really noted it in that the lawyers are behind the people and that they're not the forefront of whatever it is that the community wants to do, unless that is what the community wants to do. They want that lawyer to be that person there. So I'm hoping to fulfill that type of role and or space and really am like absorbing as many techniques and tools and skills as possible to be that type of attorney that I can be. Um, my whole future is up in the air. I just know I'm going to law school and working very hard to graduate from law school. So that is- And she's going to come back to Chester. Yeah, exactly. And if Zuline wants me to do something, then I will do that. If Zuline does not want me to do something, then I will not do that. So uh, I think Steph and Maria and 
Julian and every and even the attorneys in the last panel really spoke mm -hmm. to that it's really following what the community wants. Yeah. Any other questions from the panelists or from the audience? I, I think we have a question. Uh, I have a question. Oh, uh, who's uh, yes. So oh, this, this question is for Tyler and for Chantel. How do you see what you've learned here working uh, with Circle? How do you see you advancing that at whatever school that you're going to? I mean, they can't have all y'all, we will share. But, you know, how do you see you advancing what you, the things that you've learned? here working with Circle, and how do you also pass the torch um, to your underclassmen as sophomore? Yeah, I'd say definitely for, in terms of informing the future, I think when I began to connect the fact that a lot of the reasons that these sites showed up was because of zoning laws and the fact that like they were planned to be there, um, it made me much more interested in the process of how different things are cited and like what are the policies and laws, but the processes by which these these businesses or these industries or or these systems kind of arise and I'm really interested in like exploring that further and that's a main reason that I'm 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 pursuing a master's in urban planning um, in terms of like carrying the torch I would say that like just to offer ourselves up like in resource to some of the students that are already on the call but I think we've been like very transparent we've been very clear like we are very close to these folks too so we're also like friends so there's a level of comfort that I think is like for us to be honest and them to be honest with us um, and just making sure that we maintain that as, as much as possible. And something that I've learned working with Circle and C4 the past like basically three years is this like balance between wanting grassroots organization to overcome but also feeling like government should be doing something. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always battling between, should I be forcing the government, the Delaware County Council, the Delaware Solid Waste mm -hmm. Authority to be doing these things when it feels time and time again that they don't want to do these, do these things. And also being that like a uh, community organizer, that activist that is in those spaces to push for those actions. Mm -hmm. So I'm like constantly battling in my head, even now, even as I go to law school, I question, are these the right pathways to even be attempting to do these things? Because right. it just feels so uh, relentless sometimes and hopeless, mm -hmm. especially at that solid waste authority meeting that I showed on the video that was like so disgusting to me. How is it that I like can use the government to even try doing the right thing mm -hmm. when it feels like they don't want to do the right mm -hmm. thing? So that's uh, something I've learned throughout the process is that I can't always like, I'll, I'll be on like some sort of bounce or scale the rest of my life, I imagine. Do, do you think that there's, um, uh, Zuline has spoken in the past about wanting to imagine um, uh, allies uh, uh, and and cities like Chester and, and Newark, for example, and Flint or Detroit uh, joining together to create a law to actually draft, uh, Zuline, what you called an Endangered Communities Act. Absolutely. So, so to actually think about uh, uh, lawmaking from the ground up. Um, and, and so I'm curious um, if and, and that is something that, that people would would see as as a possible strategy. We understand that this is my logic behind it. We all know that no, as soon as you say anything about race, people go into their closets and shut themselves off. Oh, here they go again talking about race, race this, race that. It's always about race. And it's generally not people of color who do that. So I was thinking, you know, we have an endangered species act. It says we're going to protect this net over here or this spotted owl or this or that or that or this. So if we make the criteria about a community with poor health, if we make the criteria um, 
one of the things is poor access to good health care. If we make the criteria about poverty and their inability and racial and uh, I mean um, technological disparities and educational disparities and you know whatever the criteria that's going to be that's going to take that that barrier of race that keeps environmental groups out of this fight or not say environmental groups, but the traditional um, longstanding environmental groups that don't wanna to touch this issue because of racism, um, which is racist in its own right. Because a lot of the boards of these larger, more established environmental groups, their whole board is Caucasian, mostly men. So they would have no <laughs> ties to communities like Chester or people of color or indigenous people. So we take out that, 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 that handle of race and make the criteria strictly about saving endangered communities. What is an endangered community? Is it low infant birth weight? Is it high infant mortality rates? Is it cancer clusters, we can write into it whatever criteria we need to and call it the Endangered Communities Act. Who the fuck can vote against that? Who, what politician would say, oh, I'm not for the Endangered Communities Act? I think that's, it, it, it's worth it. I mean, they got something going on now at the, you know, with the White House and Biden administration. But I think it needs to be explored. Hey, Miss Joyce. So do, do we have other other thoughts and uh, people want to join uh, up and start to draft an endangered communities communities act led by circle and ironbound. Well, we need staff. We're going to need uh, Ms. Well, Foster. Yeah. We need the lawyers in the room. Absolutely. We, we, we we're going to put them in another room and me and Maria. And the students. Yeah. yeah, we're going to be on the other side telling them what to do. All right, I think I've talked to Maria about, or I don't know if I brought it up yet. No, but it most certainly sounds like a good idea, you know? And I I think even with the EJ law, we passed it where like symbolically at the city level first, mm -hmm. right? Because we knew we couldn't, at the time we had uh, Governor Christie. Um, oh. So I think like, no matter who's in charge, uh, groups can still make a difference, you know, at the local level, you just have to figure out strategy. And sometimes when you get people in certain offices that aren't working for you, well, you have to figure out a different way. Um, well, you, you also have to figure out how to get them out of office. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. And it can be done. Yeah. yeah. It can be done. We had a Green Party candidate that ran this, uh, last year. It's straight out of the box, five, six month campaign, no money. No real name recognition. And guess what? She got almost 20% of the vote. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, no, it speaks to people paving, pushing that pavement. <laughs> really yeah. makes a difference. And she'll, she'll be speaking at, at tomorrow's panel at, as well. So, Kearney. Yeah. So, um, Chris, and any questions? Yeah, actually, uh, one comment, one question. So, uh, Celine, following what you were just saying with the act that you're proposing, the criteria, that's been used before, unfortunately, on the other side of what's progressive, and that is economic development. The Keystone Opportunity Zones that built the stadium, the, uh, the casino. Yep. All, uh, yeah, all of those things. Those were all premised on communities had to show certain levels of poverty, low education scores, et cetera. So if it could be done for that, it could be done in a progressive way. So I think that there's 
If the argument is, well, why are you cherry picking, cherry picking certain things or not? Well, it's been done before. Certain mm. elements are picked, and to no benefit of the community, we should add. Absolutely. None of the economic development has translated back into uh, meaningful jobs or improvement whatsoever. So that's something there. I guess I, I wanted to put uh, Steph on the spot if I could, okay. in that all of the things that we heard today, which kind of require uh, a practice of listening, to communities uh, as opposed to speaking to, has that filtered into law school instruction? I, I guess is my question. Is, is the culture of training lawyers moving in this direction of working alongside of, or often even behind community as opposed to out front? That is a great question. And I think it has moved forward in terms of um, immersive education. So the law school clinics have focused more and more on getting students to listen because as practitioners, they have to listen. And so the skills are being taught there. Unfortunately, in the classroom, that has not been the case so much. We still teach in a very traditional kind of way about like, you know, um, here's the key cases, here's what they mean, et cetera. And it's not, it's not really focused on practice. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a disconnect there that is partly, I think, due to the way that people get to be law professors, um, right? A lot of law professors now are people who had like great grades in law school, maybe had fantastic clerkships, um, maybe wrote a whole bunch of good scholarly articles, but haven't done that kind of practice, especially not grassroots kind of practice. And so there is an absolute disconnect. Um, I think that the there are more folks who realize that this is um, a concern, at least in Wisconsin, we try to. And so um, we try to work closely with the clinical professors to integrate these skills into the classroom. But it's hard because of, as you um, observed, this sort of long standing practice of um, disconnecting what's being taught, which is just appellate cases, et cetera, with what actual um, progressive lawyering can be. Uh, but that said, like in one of my clinic, when I was in law school, I was in a clinic um, where we represented a state rep a state recognized um, tribal nation. And a lot of that involved going on field trips, listening to them about the sort of water rights they needed protected, um, helping them craft statements before water boards, um, not with us leading it, but sort of taking in what they had to say about historical fishing rights. So it was, it was really eye-opening for me and I'm glad I had that opportunity. So oh, in that forum, not only just law, but since this is primarily dealing with our case, how can the community have more access to those law schools or how do we get on campus? Um, that's a great question. A lot of um, law schools have what are called clinics. And so these clinics are dedicated to usually representing community members either in um, um, direct representation, for example, family law clinics might represent someone um, going through a divorce um, or sometimes in community types of cases. And so if there are any, and there's a lot of law schools in that area. So if any of them have clinics um, that either do environmental representation, community representation, that's some area of access. And you can sort of, there's a clinic intake kind of line, you can call them and sort of try to make your case that this would be both um, really helpful for you, but also um, helpful for students to learn how to be real world lawyers. Does that answer your question? Yes, well, one of the answers. Okay. I think Carr has a, a question in the chat. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, Carr, uh, uh, Carr's question is: Drafting legislation and electing progressive candidates sounds great, but the Democrats, as terribly flawed as they are, may be trounced in the midterm elections, and we'll have a Republican Congress. And then what? Yes, we need progressive candidates, but pragmatically, it seems we need to support people who will vote for change, even imperfectly. I'm a, fa a fan of radical change, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg's incremental strategy seems empirically to work better. What is your theory of change? That, that's a big question, Carr. Does anyone want to take this on? Or in, in why the not? Last... 
<laughs> in the last minute. Um, I mean, I don't know why you don't do both, right? Like this isn't an either or scenario. I will say that obviously the Democratic Party is not listening to young voters, to so many people. It's like obsessed with trying to capture the middle of the road voters. And in doing so, it continuously gets pushed more and more towards the right to anti-societal policies. So there does come a point where either they have to change their course or there is going to be a push for more uh, radical candidates, for more progressive candidates, right? Like that's going to happen. But I think divorce from the show that is often Republican versus Democrats. There's so much that happens at the municipal level where sometimes elections aren't contested, you know, where there aren't even parties to speak up. And I think that we need to really focus on changing the ground because that informs the national level. When we're changing who are the local elected officials, where we're pushing against school boards, against zoning boards, planning boards, you know, where again, communities get activated and become democratic participants, I think that starts to radically change the system in a way that might feel incremental at first. But I do think it's a profound and deep change that'll make all the difference. We can't just wage war on the level of DC because we're out gunned and out moneyed on that end. But are. on the local level, we have people, you know, and people will make a difference. When the local level changes, it'll have a ripple effect, a deep ripple effect. So we can't just plan or think about enacting fear because of what's happening in the midterm. We need to think five and 10 years ahead of, of ourselves. The other thing I wanted to add is that we have to think about um, state elections too, because they are determining the whole voting dis districting, right? And that's how people get gerrymandered. That's how voices get lost. Um, and so during the elections where up for grabs is, you know, whoever is in, because each state does it differently, whoever's in charge of the districting um, is up. Um, that really matters because that might lock out for 10 years, right? Um, future elections um, for super progressive candidates. So that's something to also pay attention to. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think that this is a, a, a powerful and positive place to to stop for today, especially since uh, precisely this strategy is what is what it, Chester is uh, or pro progressive candidates in Chester are pushing for state state representative and local government. Um, so I think. Um, I think that that's something to be uh, hopeful for and to and to think about tomorrow. We'll hear from two of these uh, candidates, um, but I'd like to. Uh, I don't want to leave it on that note. We're, this is what my spiel on it. Okay, people drive policy. People drive politics. People drive law. And if you mobilize the people and create stress and gravity on those processes. Ultimately, you can get something that works for the community and for the benefit of all of us. Um, there would be no change in Delaware County if Circle did not exist. Circle has not existed or the people of Chester have been viewed as being politically powerless until we started pulling on the strings in our county and our, well, the local government needs a bomb thrown on it. But anyway, we're pulling on that also. And you pull regular on, on the regulators also. It, 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 like I said earlier, it's like weaving a, a, a blanket. You can't pull one string and, and do away with it. You got to pull on multiple things at one time and create stress, stress on those entities in that atmosphere until, you know, the voice of the people are, is heard and that mobilizes the politician. Give a damn who you elect. You, nobody hires somebody for a job and leaves them alone. We in this country have that unique ability Oh, we're gonna oh we're gonna vote for this person he'll take care of it, and then we don't go and check and see what the bastard's doing we can't leave them to their own accord because it ain't for our benefit you hire somebody and then you have to manage that person 
And we have not learned effectively how to manage the politicians that we put in places. They allow profits and corporations and money to manage them because we're not hurt enough. We don't create stress in their lives enough. <laughs> so, but it can be done every day. As long as you do it, it can be done. So that's where we are. All right, Giovanna, now you can end your session. Thanks. <laughs> well, I, I, we, we want to um, thank everybody, our panelists, for speaking today, for sharing your thoughts, for giving us so much great energy and ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as N Nuseba has put in the in the chat, the link to the conference forum where people can continue the conversation as well. Um, but I look forward, all of us look forward to seeing you tomorrow, uh, bright and early at 10 a.m. Yeah, can somebody put the March flyer up again? Yeah, can, can we post the flyer again for, for the March, which is going to be happening immediately after the end of the third panel tomorrow? Um, we hope to see people who are local there. And I don't care if they come and fly in from France tonight. <laughs> so, I mean. Absolutely, come, come fly in from France. And um, thanks to everyone. And we will uh, uh, see you again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Thank you. I Bye, shall everybody. Call Tyler. Maria, get some rest.